face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. This nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Hello and welcome to episode 20 of the Policy Dialogue Series with alumni, staff, faculty, and students from the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. The views expressed do not represent official positions of the school or alumni network. Our goal is to discuss specific policy solutions that can address and solve the current local, national, and international challenges we face. We are recording this on April 2nd, 2021. My name is Evan Papp, and I graduated with the class of 2011 with a focus on international security and economic policy. And I'm the producer of uh, Empathy Media Lab, which publishes content on labor, political economy, art, and culture. Joining me is Kelly Darnell, who is the Chief Operating Officer for the Bipartisan Policy Center, which is a Washington DC based think tank that combines the best ideas from both parties to promote health, security and opportunity for all Americans. Kelly has extensive experience across several sectors, including positions in nonprofit work, banking, government, legal affairs and politics. Kelly has held political positions as a federal affairs director for the city of Atlanta and as a legislative assistant for Congressman John Lewis in the U.S. House of Representatives. She received her BA in economics from Spelman College and a master's of public management from the University of Maryland. And she also received her law degree from American University Washington College of Law. Kelly, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. So to begin, could you talk about how you first got interested in public policy? I will, I, growing up, this is a ridiculous story, but it's absolutely true. When I was a kid, I um, there was a soap opera on TV called Capital, and it was about it was actually about um, two senators, and my mother used to watch it. And coming from the background, my mom was a foster kid, my dad was a laborer. He only had a third grade education, and I just my mother went to college when I was in preschool and became a teacher, but my parents didn't know anything about policy or politics or, or you know, Capitol Hill. But this show was the first introduction I had as a little kid on what happens on Capitol Hill. And so I had in the back of my mind that this was something I absolutely wanted to do. I didn't understand what it was, but I knew making laws was a big deal. When I was at Spelman, I was a, an economics major and got an opportunity, uh, a professor presented me an opportunity to become a Woodrow Wilson fellow and get my master's in public policy. And it was great because we spent one summer, I got accepted into the fellowship. We spent one summer at the University of Michigan's public policy school after my junior year. Go blue. And after, <laughs> and then, I, I went undergrad there, that's all. You, okay. <laughs> and then, um, after we graduated, we spent the summer at LBJ and they were the LBJ school and they were intensive public policy programs and gave us the, the ability to go to a, a list of about 25 different public policy schools. And I decided to go to the University of Maryland School of Policy. And so that was really my introduction. And I knew, of course, once I got into policy and, and was able to take advantage of those programs, that this was something I very much cared about and making policy was going to be important to my career. So I have to ask, what was it like working for Representative John Lewis? You know, the youth, uh, the, um, youth is wasted on the young. I, when I was there, my experience was he was just a fan fantastic guy. People would say that I didn't really work on the Hill because I worked for him. So I didn't have members throwing chairs at me and <laughs> yelling at me. He would sit on the sofa and he would just talk to staff and have these conversations. And sadly, I think back now, I did not appreciate how amazing that was at the time. I just thought, oh, he's just this really great guy that I work for. He has great stories and let's sit around him. Given the same opportunity today, I would be holding on to every word he said and 
would be trying to get as much time as I could. But then, you know, I'm 23 years old and I think he's great and it's fun and I'm enjoying Capitol Hill. So didn't take, he was wonderful to work for, but didn't take advantage like I would now. Yeah, and just someone so down to earth and human. Yeah. Where it's so many people, it goes to their head, you know, when they get into positions of power. And that was the experience. I mean, he just would just talk to us and tell us his stories. And we were just sitting at his feet because he was so humble and nice. Awesome. So you are the chief operating officer and you've had that position in uh, numerous organizations. What is the interaction between a COO and public policy? Right now, I am able to bring all of my policy experience to the position. So BPC is a legislative think tank. We study issues range. We are bipartisan. We are not nonpartisan and we are not centrist. And that means that we as a policy director, you come to the Bipartisan Policy Center with either a conservative lens or a progressive lens. And we be- believe that you have to bring those biases and be honest to bring them to the table so that we can actually find the best solutions, create recommendations, and then we have a C4 where we advocate on them. I, in this position, one of the benefits of having corporate experience, being in government, and having so much chief operating officer experience is that what happens now is when we are discussing different policies, let's say education policy, um, or my favorite is we're working on broadband. So our organization, some of our largest policy areas are energy, economic policy, healthcare, immigration. We also do technology antitrust work in many other policy areas. But we were looking at policy and broadband, considering as as you know, what has just absolutely come to light as kids have been home virtually learning and you have telehealth that people need access to the internet. So we couldn't, our policy directors couldn't figure out why low low income people could not access the internet as it's being offered. Because I've worked so many places, I was able to bring real world experience in that. And I said, I'll tell you why they can't access it. What you don't realize is that these companies, one, they offer the lowest level of internet access. So it's just not very good. And secondly, for a lot of companies, if you're low income, if you've missed a bill, if you've ever been late in paying your cable bill, they don't offer you that service. So you have a structural issue in why people cannot access this very inexpensive internet. So I'm able to bring my real world experience to the policy debate to help the policy directors understand that sounds good on paper and that is a great academic policy, but let's talk about how it works in the real world so you can actually write better, you can create better policy. And you also worked in DC uh, as a, in the DC mayor's office on schools as well. Is that correct? I did. So I I, I do, I, I, sorry. No, I was about to say, which gave me such real world experience on how the education system works versus what we sort of see in the media and what our experience is with education. So it, my framework is totally different. So I do want to dive a little bit deeper on this question of broadband because it's now in the media with uh, Biden's proposed infrastructure plan where broadband is a part of that. And so on one end, you you have, I think, the conservative argument that says, allow the free market uh, to provide the services. And then on the other side, you have, hey, there's nonprofit um, different types of work that is allowing for broadband at a cheaper rate than the for-profit. And the the market hasn't delivered yet into a lot of these areas. And then even if you pull back the lens even further, we have the most expensive internet rates in all of industrialized countries in the world. And uh, so with all of those competing uh, views at the bipartisan uh, think tank, 
uh, center. What, how, how do you resolve that to come to a coherent, cohesive recommendation? It has been so, when we're looking at these types of reports, we bring together, we create task forces of very smart people. Um, we call them fancy people who come to the table, who, cut, who help us who help us come to the best solutions. Broadband is really complicated because you have rural broadband issues, you have urban internet issues, and then you have 5G coming. You also have the competing interest of corporate America is very powerful. And a lot of companies that provide these services, it's the expense of providing broadband in rural America is almost cost prohibitive. And so where we always get into the debate is we know the service has to happen. Someone has to pay for fiber to be laid, especially in rural. Companies don't want to pay for it. And so it's that bet who is going to pay for it. And if we say who is going to pay, if it needs to happen, who's going to pay for it? Um, how do we pay for it, right? So do we advocate for increased taxes? Who's going to pay the increased taxes? And so it ends up being, you know, the progressive side is, of course, the government should pay for broadband. Our country needs people to have access to the internet. You have the conservative view of, but who's going to pay for it? Because it can't just be, we can't, we talk about pay fors all the time at BPC, who's going to pay for it? We can't continue to increase the deficit. We have to figure out, but we don't really want corporate America to increase the taxes on corporate America. So you can imagine what this conversation is like within our organization. It's just, we have the same battles internally that America is having outside of our office on figuring out how to provide these resources, but also trying to balance who's gonna pay for them. So, Policies in general, are, is there a specific area that you're most passionate about and why? Education policy is something that I am incredibly passionate about. I believe that I grew up believing my, because of where I was from and the experience that I had with my mother going to college at a young age, my mother became a teacher. People don't always um, hold teachers in the esteem that I believe that they should, right? So, but she became a teacher and it was a big deal in our house. We had insurance for the first time. You know, she had a steady income for the first time. We had, I remember, you know, how important going to the dentist was to my parents because we finally had really good dental insurance. It was a big deal for us. I've never believed that the success of a person should be based on the parents to whom they were born. Everyone should have an opportunity to be successful in the place that that has to happen is within our educational system. It also became apparent to me, and this was, um, I did not believe this before I worked in the education. We have to be honest with our parent, be honest with ourselves about the fact that kids are not receiving what they need from their parents. So, you know, you always hear, oh, parents want to be more involved. Parents need to be more involved. If parents are involved, their kids will be more successful. Well, you know what I learned? Some parents are never going to be involved. A lot of parents are never going to be involved with their kids' education. So how do you address that? Education needs to be broader than what kids are learning during the day. It might be a meal delivery service. It might be after school care and sports. Quite frankly, it's after school tutoring and learning and it's opening the school up on the weekends. It's dealing with kids who don't have clothing, you know, teachers having to provide basic necessities for kids, and it's more of a education has to be more of a wraparound for the kid than just reading and math. And I think until we come to that realization and we continue to say, you know, the success of kids is going to be based on their parental involvement, I think we'll, we'll always be in trouble. 
And I read something about the zip code as well being so determinant of a factor and just to be born somewhere and, right. you know, not getting equal resources because you weren't in a zip code that was able to raise the taxes that are needed to um, reduce class sizes and be able to invest in the infrastructure and provide the services for the children and uh, mm -hmm. pay the teachers properly. So really appreciate that. So in a UMD School of Public Policy profile piece, you mentioned following your North Star. Could you expound upon that? My North Star was really wanting to make a difference for people who could not advocate on behalf of themselves. So I want, I've always wanted people to have every opportunity available to them and that we could remove the barriers. So at BPC, if I'm being really frank, sometimes it can be very difficult for me because of my personal politics to have friends on the other side of the aisle given everything that's taken place over the last four years, but let's say six years. But I know that if I care about racial equity, if I care about education and making sure every kid has an opportunity to have a great education. If I care about healthcare, if I care about these things and everyone having an opportunity to have a job, then I also know I have to play with people I don't naturally want to play with. I have to be close to those Republicans. I have to understand that, you know, 147 people voted not to support the electors in Congress. Some of those people I still have to play with, even though I don't want to. <laughs> I have to because if my North Star is to make our world a better place, sometimes you have to play with people you don't necessarily like. And that jo this job has taught me that in many, many ways to say, you know what, what is my goal, right? If, my, if I'm looking at my goal, if I'm looking at my North Star, then this is the process that I need to go through and I need to be okay with that. Beautiful. So in closing, uh, as we look forward to the rest of 2021 and beyond, where do you see opportunity and hope? I am excited about this administration. I am fearful on a lot that's happening with um, voter, voter suppression. It's not just we keep looking at um, we keep looking at Georgia, but remember multiple states have have uh, voter suppression laws that they're passing. We need to start looking at what's happening in Arizona um, with their voter voting rights case in the Supreme Court. I'm hopeful because I believe this administration cares about real working people and getting them back to work and giving them opportunities so that they don't have to lean on the government for help. At the same time, we cannot allow our eyes to be diverted from everything that's happening around voter suppression and around racial equity, around what's happening with not just last summer with George Floyd, but now what's happening with just the whole anti-Asian um, hate that is happening. And so I just, we need to stay vigilant and keep paying attention. We finally, I believe, have someone in the White House who cares about people, not perfect, right? I don't want anyone to think that I worry about some of the things they're proposing and how we'll pay for them too. But I think we're in a better direction. The one thing I want more than anything is a boring president so that we can just talk about policy and not personality. But we, we have to stay vigilant in everything that's continuing to happen because I am very idealistic in the type of world that I want to live in.